All right, I'd like to welcome everybody to today's Catapult session. We'll get started. And uh, I'll just introduce myself. I'm Scott High. I'm the Technical Services Director here at Computer Aided Technology. And I'm excited about the topic today because uh, we do get a lot of calls to technical support and we do a lot of presentations around how to get the best performance out of SOLIDWORKS, whether it be in assemblies or large part models. Um, or just hardware, all sorts of questions around performance. So I want to introduce you to Jordan Puentes, who's going to uh, take us through this presentation today on exactly this topic. So Jordan has been with Computer Aid Technologies for over three years now, and uh, he's achieved his elite AE status. So within the SOLIDWORKS reseller uh, community, that's a, the highest award that you can be given as a, uh, as a technical team member. So Jordan achieved that, I think, faster than anybody that I know. So he's a sharp guy, and so we're super excited to have him help us through this topic today. This is a presentation that he put together um, with some of our team, um, gathering the experience from folks that have been here for a long time and have used SOLIDWORKS for a long time, a presentation that he put together to present at SOLIDWORKS World, and uh, we're happy to have him present it to us uh, here today. So, Jordan, with that, I'll hand it over to you. Awesome. Thank you, Scott. Scott kind of came up with uh, it was a great uh, kind of synopsis of what I'm going to be covering, which is basically large assemblies. So, you know, the big question that I like to start this, and I usually do a show of hands, but... Since everybody has signed up for this uh, catapult session, I know that you work with large assemblies. And anybody that works with large assemblies usually dreads working with their large assemblies. So usually when I say raise your hands, about everybody's hand shoots up in the air when I ask that question. Um, so basically the idea behind working with large assemblies and not wanting to work with them revolves around performance. So when it comes to performance, um, you may be, these things may be familiar to you. Long loading times. Uh, file reference, losing the file references, feature tree errors, mating errors, no solution. These are all errors that you see in SOLIDWORKS. An error was encountered, contact technical support. This is an actual error in SOLIDWORKS, and I'll actually show you how to get it. This may take a while. I'll show you how to get that error later. But basically, given all of these errors, this can be a little bit frustrating. I think we can all relate with how frustrating it can be to get all of those errors, you know, whether it be one or all of them at the same time. But working with large assemblies doesn't have to be that way. So for those of you with high blood pressure, I want to go, here's a little puppy for you, see if it can calm you down. Um, but what's the first thing you do when any of these errors come up? Try opening the assembly on another computer. Okay, what if that doesn't work? You can vent to a coworker. I like this one. Perform your weekly PMs. I call it percussive maintenance. Or most importantly, contact your bar. Contact us. We see these problems every day. We're good listeners, and hey, we may even solve your issue. However, the point of this presentation, what if you guys have the tools to fix it? So that's kind of what I'm going to walk you through. It's a little bit of a case study as far as uh, one of our customers actually called in with this large assembly, and basically we've all been in this situation where the large assembly's been working up to a point, and then the next day you go to open it, and it didn't even open for him. So he was looking at a large assembly that was working yesterday, but he couldn't even open it the next day. So, you know, we've all been there with large assemblies. They were, they were working, then they don't work. They're really slow. They're sluggish. So I'm going to walk you through kind of a case study of this assembly, and this actually happened. Uh, this customer gave us the permission to use their model set kind of as a learning experience for everyone. And I'll walk you through everything that we found and some additional things that you can use to pinpoint the uh, sluggishness in your large assemblies. So kind of the roadmap of what we're going to cover today, I will show you ways to interrogate your data set. Information you can glean from the data set without even opening it in SOLIDWORKS. Because remember, we can, we can open this assembly when we first got it. The next thing I'm going to show is some tips to actually get the file open in SOLIDWORKS because that's our biggest hurdle. We need to get the file open in SOLIDWORKS before we can start sifting through and working on the performance side. Next, I'll show you how to identify slow and problematic files. Then I'll show you how to clean it up, so some um, clever modeling techniques that you can use to make your models quicker in SOLIDWORKS. And then finally, opening the improved assembly, and then I'll kind of go into some of the background too as far as what SOLIDWORKS is doing when it's opening those assemblies, and uh, some hardware things you can improve as well. So kind of an overall uh, how to address large assembly performance. So the first thing I'm going to start with is interrogating your data set. 
There's a lot of information that you can get from your data set with just Windows Explorer. These include sorting techniques, how to tell what your file sizes are, file versions, and even a file preview. So let's go ahead and start with sorting. If you just open up in Windows Explorer, you know you have a list of all of your part files, and you know if you hit the top of those columns where it says type and size, you can actually sort by those. Well, okay, we all know how to sort, but if you didn't know this, if you hold down the shift key, you can sort by multiple columns. So if you sort by your type column first, hold down your shift key and then select another column, you will size by column A first and then do a sub sort on column B. And I'll show that to you live too. I'm just kind of going over all of the topics first, but if you didn't know that, you can sort by two columns. Holding down that shift key, that's kind of the trick, and then it's basically sorted by type and then size. But using that information, and I'll go ahead and show that to you in Windows Explorer now, but basically if we go into this model, we know we have type and size. So I can sort by type, but if I sort by type and then hold down the shift key, I will then sort by size. So now I have all of my assembly from high size to low, and then as soon as I get into my part documents, it starts to re, uh, resort. What's really nice about these two is any given file, you can always, if you just select the file and you go down here at the bottom, it will tell you your size. So this is about seven megabytes. It says it up here as well. But in this case, if you want to tell how many sub-assemblies that you have, you can go ahead and use the shift key and select all of your assemblies, and I know I have 74 assemblies in my file set. I can do the same thing with parts. So if you want to get a good idea of how many parts you have, 483, you can get an idea of how many assemblies you have, how many parts you have, general size. That's a lot of information you can have before you even jump into opening the part. Also, which version was your file saved in? Is this important? Um, this actually is very important. So uh, in Windows Explorer, you can kind of customize what information that you see in your file set. So if you want to uh, optimize your settings for documents, you can apply those settings as folder templates. And I'll show you how to do that as well. But you can enable additional column properties to tell you which version you were last saved in uh, with your SolidWorks file. And I'll show you how to add that as well. So if I jump back to Windows Explorer, all you have to do is right click up here in these columns and go down to More. Once you go to More, if you scroll down to the S's, because that's where it's going to be, and you find SW for SolidWorks, you can check the last save with and open time. So with the last save with, it'll tell you which version you last saved that SolidWorks file. And it didn't start tracking open time until I think like 17 or 18, so you may not have an open time until you save it in the later versions. But this is a great way to tell what version you saved your files in. If I sort by this, I can see this file set actually has some files last saved in 2011, 2012, 15, 16, and so on. So there's some older files in here that I can tell just by using Windows Explorer. So a lot of information you can glean with these as well. And again, that was just a right click at the top of the columns. If you would like to apply that to all of your folders using the options, uh, and this is using Windows 10, but in the options for Windows Explorer, you can change the folder and search options and apply this to all of your folders. That way, all of your folders will show SolidWorks last saved with and the SolidWorks last open time. So definitely use that. A lot of people don't know that that's there. They added that back around 15 or 16, and like I said, the open time was 17 or 18. But those are really good information to use, uh, whether you're having problems with your files or not. Uh, next up, use the file preview. So that's another Windows option. So using that file preview, when you're working with these, again, use this um, view setup. You can set a preview pane, and as you scroll through your files, you get a nice preview. These are screen captures captured by Windows. So it captures basically the last saved snapshot uh, in the Windows cache, and you can actually scroll through those. So you get a good idea of, okay, how complex is the part? How small is it? How big is it? If there's any problems. Again, they may not all have a preview. That's being controlled by Windows. So if usually if you open it and save it and close it, then it shows that preview. But definitely use that file preview because it's a great way to interrogate those files, again, without even having opened them. Jordan, we have a question. 
Yeah. Um, so with regards to using this method, that would work with SOLIDWORKS PDM as well, right? We can turn the columns on and show this because PDM runs inside of the Windows Through Explorer. Windows Explorer, correct. So you can set up those columns in the same interface, yep, and just save it to all your folders. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, and that again, that is a Windows set. So just right-click at the top and go down to More, and you can find those. So definitely use all of those techniques. Again, we haven't even opened the model yet, but at least now I have a good snapshot of how many parts do I have? How many assemblies do I have? What do they look like? But now let's kind of move on to getting the file open up in SOLIDWORKS because again, this was working one day and then it wasn't the next. So um, in this case, the first thing I always recommend if you can't open your assembly, try opening it on another machine. That tells us if it is machine specific or file specific. So if you try to open on a coworker's machine and it doesn't work on your coworker's machine too, there's a good chance it's the file that's the problem and not settings on your own computer. So that's the first thing I always recommend is definitely on multiple machines. But in this case, we can actually use some different open configurations as well to try to troubleshoot the opening of the assembly. So there's different opening modes. I'm sure we've all heard resolved, lightweight, large assembly, and large design review. So to access these, you have to use file open from inside of SOLIDWORKS. So I'm going to jump over to SOLIDWORKS now. So basically I'm saying don't use Windows Explorer, but if you go up to File Open from SOLIDWORKS and you choose an assembly, you will have the ability to choose different modes to load it in. So Fully Resolved is obviously going to bring in Fully Resolved, which is all of the part files, all of the features, everything needed to make the file. What Lightweight does is it drops off the features and brings in the planes and the origins to mate to. Uh, so it'll bring in just graphical representation with some um, the base geometry, your planes and your origins. Large assembly mode is basically lightweight, but it strips out uh, some additional performance things to save on performance. So large assembly mode will disable some of your shaded views and um, sketch views, some stuff to just boost that performance a little bit more. And then large design review is the most restrictive. It even restricts which, um, so you have basically limited measuring modes. Um, the highest performance settings or the lowest performance settings to get you the most performance out of your model. So large design review is usually for 1,000 plus part models that you want to open and then you can resolve them as needed. So try the different loading modes for your assemblies. But down here is the really important one. You can load different configurations. So if there's different configurations, try loading all of the configurations of your model. But also utilize this advanced. So I'm going to jump down here to this advanced really quick and hit open. With this advanced, what it's going to do is give me a prompt and give me some more advanced options. These more advanced options include open currently selected configuration. I could have done that from the default menu. But it allows me to create new configurations. So what if all of my current configurations are corrupted? Well, I can create a new configuration uh, inside my model and open it in that new configuration to see if it's the configurations causing the problem. So I have two different modes of configurations that I can use. The first one creates a new configuration showing all of the reference models. So that will just create a new configuration and bring in all the same part files. Or I can create a new configuration which only shows the assembly structure. And that's the one I'm going to use here. So I'm going to name this new configuration Open for Testing. So what I'm going to do is open this assembly while creating a new configuration, but it's only going to show my assembly structure. So I'll show you what that looks like. So I'm going to hit OK, and everything is suppressed. And if I go to my configuration tree, I can see I've got a new configuration that says open for testing. So we weren't able to open the assembly before, but creating our new configuration with all of my parts suppressed, we were able to get this file actually open. And that is our first goal. That is always our goal with uh, assembly files that can't open is getting them open in SOLIDWORKS. Because what we can do at that point is then systematically start to unsuppress single parts and see if we can identify which parts were actually causing us the issue. Maybe there's just a single corrupt part file in there. Maybe there's a missing reference or cyclical reference. So we can go in here and just unsuppress one by one to try to figure out what the um, perpetrator, or basically which part was causing us the issues. So you can unsuppress multiple parts at the same time. So I unsuppressed that folder, which brought all of those parts. 
And if you're feeling braver, you can even shift click multiples and start unsuppressing those by chunks. So at that point, you don't have to do it one by one, but you can systematically unsuppress parts to start to see your assembly come together and see if you can identify uh, which file is causing the problem. So again, the only way you can get to this is by using the file open inside of SolidWorks to open these. Try those different modes, resolve lightweight, large assembly, large design, and use that advanced configuration when using that open for configurations. So that new configuration that we created showed just the assembly structure with all of the suppressed components. So in this case, we unsuppress one by one, and we can start to see our assembly come together. So eventually, we hit our first error. This is a file reference error. And I will show you that these lost file references are actually a huge hit to performance when it comes to open times. SolidWorks really wants to know where every single file is located. And in this case, we were able to contact the customer. They were able to locate that file and send it to us, and we were able to put it in its correct file reference and restore that. But I'll show you in a bit later in the presentation why this is holding you up so much. But basically, walking through these, you can start to see uh, why your assembly might be having problems. So we continue past that one. We, just, we were able to resolve it after we located the file. And we'll keep unsuppressing these until we get to the end. So that was step one, just getting the file open. So use those different open techniques. Use the advanced configuration open. Use the others. Again, just getting the file open in SolidWorks is our first goal. So once we actually had the file open, our next step was how do we make it perform better? So in this case, how do we identify our slow and problematic files? There are a lot of reasons why your assembly might be slow. These include older version files, educational files, graphical triangles, imported geometries, flexible subassemblies, file references. There is a lot of reasons why they're slow. I'm going to cover the big ones, the biggest performance hits. Um, and ways you can make your assemblies more efficient once they're open. So we're going to start with older version files. Older version files do cause slower open times, especially if they were uh, saved before SolidWorks 2015. So around 2015, they actually changed their file compression and they made it better. So your file sizes were smaller and they open faster. So anything pre-2015, definitely save into the latest version. So anytime you see this, you may see that at the top under the file, there's going to be a little warning that says older version file. Just save the entire assembly again. Convert everything to your latest version. It definitely helps with open times. And I have the numbers to support that. So at the end, I'm going to show some numbers that actually support that saving it in the newer version does open faster. Uh, I just want to mention, too, there is a batch conversion in the task scheduler. So if you don't want to do it manually or do a save all, you can run that in the background and just have SolidWorks Task Scheduler update all those files. It's basically just a, it's kind of like a macro where it just opens the file, saves it, closes it, opens it, saves it, closes it over and over. That way you don't have to do it manually. But definitely saving your files to the latest version will help you with your open times. Second is educational files. If you ever see this blue hat, that means you have an educational file. What an educational file means is it's going to watermark that part file and any drawings that you make for academic use only. So just be aware that one EDU file in your assembly will watermark your entire assembly. So be very careful with these educational files. If you, uh, basically, if you have them, try to remodel it in the commercial version or see if you can basically get a different model. You don't want to use those educationals if you're using this in a commercial space because it will watermark it. So I do want to say there is a way to scrub these, but it's only in exceptional circumstances. We have to go to SolidWorks and we have to present a very good reason to SolidWorks why you want to scrub it. And at that point, it still takes them several business days. So I just want to say it is possible, but it's in exceptional circumstances only. So if you see those educational files, um, just try to distance yourself from them and don't use them in your assemblies because it will watermark your entire assembly. So we get to the big one, assembly visualization. So there is a tool inside SolidWorks that is used to identify something called graphical triangles. Now these graphical triangles are huge to performance. 
The more triangles you have, the slower your part will be. Uh, and it's a one-to-one -one correlation on these graphical triangles to slower performance. The more triangles, the slower your part. And this is for everything. This is for file size. This is for open times. This is for even performance when you're just rotating your model around. So let me give you a quick tour of assembly visualization. So in this case, I haven't unsuppressed everything. I'll go ahead and unsuppress a few more um, just so I can get a full view of my assembly visualization or at least a, a larger view. And of course, I have errors in this assembly, but that's OK. Our main goal was to just get the assembly open. But if you go to the Evaluate tab and you run the command called Assembly Visualization, what it's going to do is analyze every single part in your assembly. And if you do not have graphical triangles up here at the top, what you can do is hit this little arrow and go down to More. And there is a lot of different properties that you can choose to list inside your assembly visualization. And it will sort it for you based off the sizes. So in this case, we want to find the G's, and we have graphics triangle. So we can turn that on and add it. So it's telling me that the column is already here. So we can sort by our graphical triangles, and we can go down to, if anything says zero, it's in lightweight, because again, it's graphical only. But if we go to the highest, we can see that there are parts with a lot of graphical triangles. And as I mentioned, the more triangles that you have, the slower your part will be. And again, this is assembly visualization. You can change these color-coded sliders as well, so you can get different colors as far as where your max and where your min is. So anything above about 12,000 graphical triangles right now will appear dark red. So definitely use assembly visualization. It lets you know how many graphical triangles you have. So I'm going to close this assembly uh, right now, just to kind of, because I want to show something else, and I don't want this to slow it down. So I'm going to go ahead and close this assembly, but we're not done with those graphical triangles yet. I want to go into depth as far as what those graphical triangles do and what we can do to reduce those. So a lot of complex features in geometries have these high graphical triangle counts. Some of the biggest perpetrators are helical cut threads. So if you've ever experienced a swept cut, that's one of the most computationally expansive features you can use in SOLIDWORKS. So basically any threads, if you model your threads, those are going to be very, very slow. So helical cut threads are a big one. Helical springs are another. Internal helical cuts, I think we're seeing a pattern here. They're all helical swept cuts. Those are going to be the ones that slow you down the most. And if you look at the one in the center, you can kind of picture how many graphical triangles SOLIDWORKS is using to try to describe that motion. There's a ton. And those are going to slow you down. So let's go ahead and take a look at some of these. I'm going to start with this one right here. And we're going to take a look at those graphical triangles and how much they affect the part. So I'm going to go ahead and open this part in SOLIDWORKS. And notice this is a single part. Now, before I go too much in depth into this, I think we've all seen here um, inside our parts, maybe sometimes our circles don't quite look circular. I think we've seen a point where sometimes they look a little triangular. Well, that's controlled by a document property. So if I go to my Tools Options and I go to Document Properties, I can set my Image Quality Slider. Now, this is a direct correlation to how many graphical triangles I have. And I'm going to run through a little study for you here, too. So my graphical slider count is pretty high, and I may not need it. But I'm going to hit OK and keep it for now, and I'm going to save this file. So I'm just going to do a file save as, put it on my desktop, because I want to investigate this a little bit. So if I go to my desktop, I'm going to have to stop sharing here so I can see my part file. But I just saved this. And if I go to Properties, this is a 3 meg file. This is a 3 meg file as is. Well, if I go back to SOLIDWORKS, and if I just go back to that Options, Document Properties, Image Quality, and I slide this down, well, I didn't see a big jump in my part quality. It kind of looks the same, and it's definitely workable. And if I save this and go back to my desktop, that file size just dropped in half. So image quality is saved per document, and it directly affects the file size. So let's go ahead and go back to that. And I'm going to go, just to show you another way you can get to that, under System Options, Performance. 
There's also a little button here that takes you to image quality. Same place, uh, but it is a document property, so it is saved per file. But let's kick it all the way down. Hit OK. Sure, my threads start to look a little ugly, but that's OK. You're not even going to see those threads in the overall assembly. But I'm going to hit Save on the part, and let's go ahead and look at the size. I was able to drop it to about 1 meg, so I dropped it in half. But just on the flip side of that coin, let's go back to Options. Let's kick it all the way up into the red zone. It's even going to give you an error, or not an error, but at least a warning. Sliding into the red zone will cause the file size to increase, graphics performance to be slower, and substantially increased memory usage. So if I hit OK, my computer is actually going to sit here and chug for a while. This isn't an instantaneous operation because it's generating all of those graphical triangles. If I try to click, I'm sure my computer is even going to say, hey, I'm still thinking. So that image quality slider is more important than you think. So if I go to this now, sure, my part looks fantastic. And if I hit save and go look at my file size now, that's almost a 9 meg file. That's almost nine times, actually not even almost, that's over nine times bigger than with my image quality slider lowered. So be aware of that image quality slider. I'm going to harp on that one a lot because that's one of the biggest things that we see. Everybody sets their image quality really high and they wonder why their large assembly is running so slow because it's generating all of those graphical triangles for every single part and it's way higher than it needs to be. So kick it down somewhere down here. Actually, before I do that, I'm going to keep it at the high quality, and I want to check the graphical count, see how many graphical triangles are on this part. So if I go to Evaluate, I'm not going to see assembly visualization at the part level. So a little trick you can use, just create an assembly from a single part. So take this part, just hit OK. So now I have an assembly of just this part. We'll insert it. And now I can run assembly visualization on this single part. Again, if I go to More, and I go down to Graphical Triangles, I've got 327,000 graphical triangles. So that is way more than I need, and that's definitely going to slow down my assembly. So let's go back to that part level. Let's go back to that image quality slider now document properties, and let's slide it down to something a little more reasonable, down here. I'll hit OK. It still looks the same, and if I hit Save and go back to the assembly, well, guess what? I dropped it down to 15,000 graphical triangles. That dropped it by almost over 300,000 graphical triangles. So that image quality slider has a huge effect. Definitely set it low when you don't need it. Um, I also want to mention, too, that that assembly slider or that graphical triangle slider, there's one at the assembly level as well. So every document has its own image quality slider. So the assembly has a slider as well as the part has a slider. So if you would like to change just the assembly level, there's a little checkbox in the image quality to apply to all referenced part documents. So if you're at the assembly level and you kick that slider down, you can apply that to all the different parts as well. So if I go now and change this to super low, apply to all reference documents, I did this at the assembly level, I've dropped it down to 8,000 graphical triangles, and if I go to the part, the part now has that very low image quality as well. So definitely pay attention to those image quality sliders. It has everything to do with your file size, your open times, and even your, even your performance when you're just rotating this guy. You saw how long it took to calculate even just setting this image quality slider high on a single part. So imagine what your whole assembly is doing. Uh, so pay attention to those. Another little trick for you, use simplified configurations. There's still a whole lot more detail on this part than we actually need, uh, especially when you're modeling these entire threads. You don't have to model these entire threads. What I'm going to do is create a new configuration in this part, and I'm going to call it simplified. So I just created a new configuration called Simplified, and in this Simplified configuration, I removed the neural pattern on the top and replaced my thread. In this case, I used an appearance. You can use the cosmetic thread. I highly recommend using the cosmetic thread because it has a thread callout included. But if you want to use the appearance as well, I just use the default SOLIDWORKS appearance. So if you're not familiar with the appearances, 
you go to that little beach ball on the right uh, and you go to miscellaneous, there's a screw thread pattern in here. So if we drag the screw thread pattern over and we apply it to the face, you may need to change the mapping a little bit because again this isn't a cosmetic thread, this is just mapping the screw thread. I can change the mapping to a little bit bigger, but now I've got a graphical screw thread and I'm not actually modeling that um, the thread or the swept cut or what have you. We have a question. With regards to saving this out as an STL to send to a 3D printer, does the image quality have anything to do with? Is this where it no. starts for that? No. You know? uh, they're re highly, highly related, but the image quality slider has nothing to do with the STL output. And um, I can show that. I'm actually going to show the STL output in Perfect. a little bit later in the presentation. Okay. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah, those are not correlated. So. Um, for this model, just to kind of finish this out, I'm now in my simplified configuration. If I go back to my kind of measuring assembly and I change my configuration to our new simplified and I take a look at the graphical triangles, I've dropped it to 116 from 330,000. So you can bet that this pin is going to perform a whole lot faster in my assembly now than it did before. So that was just the first part that I had in here. I'm going to walk through a couple more um, because these were all parts that we found in the customer's assembly that they were running into. So for this next part, kind of the same idea as far as, all right, I see some things that are, could be causing problems. First place that I want to look, first place I want to train you to look, go to image quality. Again, way higher than it needs to be. First thing we'll do, kick it down. Next thing we'll do, create that simplified configuration. You don't need to put those threads in there unless you're sending it off to 3D print and you absolutely need the threads. Create a simplified configuration. Work without the threads. And then when you actually need to print it, go back to your default configuration and print that file. So work in the simplified file. You don't need to see those threads. You don't need to rebuild them every single time. Uh, in this case, we use the appearance, but again, we can use the cosmetic thread. Definitely save us that time that we normally spend rebuilding the part. So here's another one. Again, they just had a bunch of these fasteners in here that were causing all of these issues. Um, so again, we move to a simplified configuration, remove the thread, and lower that under performance image quality, lower that image quality. Again, reduce those graphical triangles, and for all intents and purposes, these parts are reacting the exact same as they did before. So the next thing that affects performance, import diagnostics. Um, basically, this is any time you import a CAD native file. So in this case, we had a few imported files. Now let me show you where these could cause issues. Notice this is just an imported file here. This is what we call a dumb solid. Um, in this case, to run import diagnostics, you right-click the solid and run your import diagnostics. And it tells us there's actually some faulty faces in here. Um, we can hit this button down here to heal all, but I'm going to show you the problems you run into when you don't run import diagnostics. Let's say we import the model. It looks good. Now we want to go to this and we want to enlarge the hole. And we're going to enlarge the hole by just making another circle and we're going to punch a hole through it. And I'm going to say through all. Pretty simple operation. Well, guess what? It says feature failed to cut the body. Well, there's problems here. I don't know what's going on. I just imported this model. Uh, it could cause problems at the assembly level when I try to do assembly level features because there's errors in the imported geometry. So let's go ahead and exit this. So we're going to go out of the sketch. And now let's run those import diagnostics. It found two faulty faces. I'm going to hit attempt to heal all. And now let's try that same operation. I'm just going to put down that circle an extrude cut through all, and now it works. So that faulty geometry causes more problems down the line. You want to repair your geometry as soon as you import it. Otherwise, it's going to cause you headaches, and it's going to be really hard to find why that assembly level feature is failing way down the road when it's caused by some small imported geometry part that you didn't even know existed. So another thing to note about that imported geometry, as soon as you create SolidWorks features, you can no longer run import, or import diagnostics. So if you start modeling on your part, you lose that ability. So if we delete this, and we'll delete the 
sketch with it, so it's just the imported body, we get the ability to run import diagnostics. So it has to be the first thing you do, and as I mentioned, always run import diagnostics. It's going to save you uh, issues down the line. Next up is flexible subassemblies. If you're unfamiliar with flexible subassemblies, what these mean is if you put a subassembly with mates into your top-level assembly, so it's now a subassembly, SolidWorks will not evaluate those mates unless you tell it to be flexible. <clears throat> so if the subassembly is rigid, so it's not flexible, it's basically going to lock the parts in place as they were at the subassembly level. However, if you set that subassembly to flexible, it will evaluate all of those subassembly mates at the top level alongside all of your top level mates. So essentially it's adding on to all of the top level mates. It's now evaluating all the subassembly mates as well. So if you run performance eval, it'll tell you how many evaluated mates there are, and of those, how many are top level and how many are flexible. So I definitely, I'm definitely not here to tell you to never use flexible subassemblies, but only use them when you have to. Um, so, you know, essentially if you need flexible subassemblies for whatever reason, it was easier to model, create another configuration at the top level, and in that other configuration, contain your flexible subassemblies, and then create a configuration at the top level that's just all the rigid configurations. That way, you have the movement when you need it, but definitely don't work in your assembly with the flexible subassemblies because it's just adding to the rebuild time. So every time you rotate and it's reevaluating those mates, it's going to take a lot longer. So flexible subassemblies, while useful, definitely cause performance slowdowns of your assembly, especially in large assemblies. So just be aware of that as well. Um, next up is the file references. I mentioned this in the beginning. These file references are really hurting your open times, and I'll show you why. So if you're trying to open a part and SOLIDWORKS tells you that it can't find it, the reason it's telling you it can't find it is because it's already looked in several locations and could not find it. So just to give you some background too, just to know where SOLIDWORKS is looking for files, in your assembly if you go to the file pull down and find references, you'll get a list of where SOLIDWORKS is looking for every single file and it wants to be able to find every single file. So just some background, anytime you get that message, SOLIDWORKS has already looked in all of these locations. So the first place SOLIDWORKS looks when you open it and when it can't find a document is your current open documents. So if you've ever wondered why if you have a file with the same name already open and SOLIDWORKS opens that one and not the one you wanted, it's because it's searching open documents first. Then it goes and searches for any folders you specified for reference documents. This is an options location or in your system options and file locations you can set these reference document locations. If it can't find it in the first two, it goes to the whole folder of the active document. If it can't find it there, it goes to the folder path of the last open document. If it can't find it there, it goes to the folder path where the last reference document was found, so on and so forth. So there's actually a chain of places that SOLIDWORKS is going to look and if it can't find it in any of those places, then it prompts you that it can't find the file. So if you're wondering, you know, why these file references are so important, well, it's because if it, SOLIDWORKS can't find a file, it's performing so many searches before it prompts you that, hey, where's this file? I can't find it. So fixing those file references by locating the file and resaving it to restore that file reference is critically important to getting your file or your assembly to open quicker. So those file references are very, very important. So now we've kind of seen the different files and how we can identify which of these files are causing our issues through assembly visualization um, and other techniques. Let's go over some creative ways that we can use modeling to help reduce the amount of graphical triangles that we have as well. So I have some different methods here for cleaning up your part geometry. Some of them may be new, some of them may not be. Uh, but these are just some ideas to get you thinking of how we can use SOLIDWORKS modeling to get us over some of these humps. So the first one, remove unnecessary detail. So in this case, we have a part. There's some internal pipe threads in here. We really don't need those internal threads. Uh, but if I go through and I create that new simplified configuration, 
So we'll go ahead and make this simplified. There's a couple different ways I can go about it. One, I can go through and try to just suppress my sweeps. You know, sometimes this may cause errors. I can't always identify where all of my commands are to unsuppress things. So, you know, if this is the imported part or it's really hard, just create a sketch. Just create a brand new feature and we can model over it. So, it doesn't even need to be perfect in this case because we're just cleaning up those graphical triangles. And if we extrude both of these circles, just to make sure that they overlap, and we'll say merge result, well, guess what? No more internal geometry. We reduced all of those graphical triangles. So now my simplified configuration, I can either suppress those parts or I can just model over them. This is especially useful for when you have imported geometry and you can't just suppress those parts. So that's another way that you can reduce that geometry while still having it contained in the file just in a different configuration. So in this configuration, what I would do is just suppress that one single part. And now I have my threaded part and my non-threaded part. So remove unnecessary detail internal to your parts as well. Now this is one of those instances. This right here is a ball bearing. But without having interrogated this part using assembly visualization, we found that this had high graphical triangle count. Well, if we go and section this part, it's because they modeled every single internal bearing in this ball bearing. So we really don't need to do that. So there's two different ways we can approach this one as well. So let's go ahead and go to the simplified configuration. Looks the same from the outside, but if we look at the inside, it's all completely filled in. That's because what we did was the same thing, I, same technique I used in my last one where we just create two circles in a sketch and we extrude and merge that geometry. So that's one way to go about it. But let's say we don't want to go that route, but we still want to get rid of all of this internal geometry. Well, since these are all separate solid bodies, I can use a command called delete keep bodies. So in this case, we'll go ahead and keep it sectioned. And if you don't know where delete keep bodies is, you can always just search it up here in command search. So I can delete bodies. I can just go through and select all of these ball bearings and just delete those bodies. So at that point, using one single feature, we've at the same time now reduced this to reduce all the graphical triangle counts trying to describe those spheres. So two different ways you can think about it. You can either model over it and merge it, or you can use delete key bodies in this case, a quick way to just get rid of all of that geometry, internal geometry that you don't need to reduce your graphical triangle count. And again, I've kind of been passing over these, but always check that image quality slider. It's usually a lot higher than it needs to be. Again, that's going to reduce your file size, it's going to make it open quicker, it's going to make it rotate quicker also. So definitely check that image quality slider. Um, this is kind of a clever one. You're bound to run into text on your files at some point. So if we look at this part here, this was an imported solid. So this is text that I can't just go in and suppress. So in this case, what I'm going to do is just use a series of extrusions to just remove all of that geometry that I don't need. But let's say at my assembly level, I actually need to be able to see this text. Well, there's two ways I can go about reusing it or even removing it. But in this case, if we want to remove the text, we use the delete face command. So if you're not familiar with delete face, I'll do one um, on this kind of smaller model. But I'm going to go ahead and choose all the internal faces of this model right here. And I'm going to use a command called delete face. And I'm going to use delete and patch. What that's going to do is delete all the faces I have selected and extend the adjacent face to patch it as if that text was never there. So I can use delete face at that point if I also want to, if I don't want to just extrude over it. I can also use delete face to remove it. But let's go ahead and keep that because I have one that just removes all of those faces. But let's say you do want the text on there and you do want to reuse that text. Create a sketch. Create a sketch that uses convert entities of what that text was and use a command called split. So if you use this split command, what you're able to do is just project that sketch onto that face and split that face into multiple faces 
That essentially then look like text, but it's all just one single face that is split using a sketch. And if you can't find it, go up here to split line. Um, using split line will project a sketch onto your face and split that face. So definitely use split line. Really useful, a nice trick to get text onto your part without actually having to engrave or emboss that text, which causes um, a lot more graphical triangles, a lot larger file, a lot slower open times. We have a question relating to this. So this individual, um, their company, you know, generally has communicated to them that when they have multiple configurations, it's like having additional parts or assemblies in the file. Obviously, the file does get a little larger if you have multiple configurations. So they're asking about it does making these simplified configurations, but now having, say, two or maybe three configurations in the part or assembly, um, how does that alter the file size? And then maybe talk a little bit about how SOLIDWORKS would load those configurations. Sure. Yeah, and I'll touch on that, too. Your file size may get a little bit larger, but whenever you open your assembly, you'll notice little um, icons on your configuration menu. Basically, what SOLIDWORKS is doing is loading your active configuration into memory. So it's loading your active configuration, but I have a gray dash down here, which tells me I haven't loaded my simplified configuration yet. So it's, even though that configuration information is there, SOLIDWORKS isn't loading it until you need it. So notice how it's a dash, which means SOLIDWORKS doesn't, essentially doesn't know what it looks like because it's never opened it. So if I make simplified my active, notice it changes to a green telling me it's active. Um, it's my active configuration and up to date. And if I go back to my default, now look what happens. It's not a gray dash anymore. It's a gray check because now that information is loaded into SOLIDWORKS memory. So even though you have additional configurations at, at the part level, and yeah, your part file part size may get a little bit larger, it's not going to load that configuration information until you load it. So this is going, it's going to open faster in the simplified configuration. Your other data is still there. It's just loaded on demand. So it's going to open faster in the simplified configuration than it would open in your default configuration. So just be aware of that. Sure, it's a larger file, but you're getting that performance on open. You're getting the performance as you're working through it. So a lot of performance increases in SOLIDWORKS by using those configurations. So with the text, um, just kind of a clever way to deal with the text, use the split line command. Um, here's another one. And this is the one where I was going to show that STL output. So we've got a coil here. And just to kind of show you, this isn't a one-to-one -one representation of how SOLIDWORKS creates graphical triangles, but exporting STL converts things to graphical triangles, so it's kind of similar. So I use that as a teaching moment. But if I go to Save As, and I change this to an STL, if I hit Options, this is what controls um, in here, this Course, Fine, and Custom, this is what controls in the STL output how many graphical triangles there are. So in this case, what I'm going to do is switch this to fine. So this is going to create a fine mesh for me. I'm going to hit OK and save this to my desktop. You'll notice it creates a kind of graphical preview of how many graphical triangles there are. So just to give you an idea, this is 135,000 graphical triangles. We absolutely do not need that many. Remember the first files that we started with? There was 325,000 you don't need that many graphical triangles. So again, this is the STL output. It's completely different than image quality. So you set your STL output at the STL level, so image quality doesn't pertain to that, two different locations. But it's kind of a nice way to visualize how many graphical triangles there are. So I'm going to hit no, and I'm going to go back to that save as STL. And this time I'm going to change it to coarse. So again, for the STL output, this is where you do that to set your mesh size. And when I save it as course to my desktop, it'll give me the preview. This looks a whole lot better, and it's only 24,000 graphical triangles. So you can start to see, hopefully this helps you visualize what the graphical triangles look like and why it's taking so much time to load that and why just a small jump in the tolerance is what's causing so many more graphical triangles. So 24,000, you're looking more to be in this realm of sizes. Um, but just kind of covering the STL output as well as what those graphical triangles look like. So for this one, what we wanted to do is keep the overall appearance of the spring, 
but reduce how many curved faces we have on the inside of the spring. So essentially what we used was a sketch just barely smaller than the inside diameter, and then we just extruded that in both directions. So we can start to see that it now smoothed out that inside face. So if I do that same STL save, and I change, keep it at my course level, I've reduced it even further, down to 18,000. So it's just removing that internal geometry. In this case, there's some different tricks you can use. Um, it still looks like the spring from the outside. For all intents and purposes, it reacts the exact same. But we're removing all of that internal geometry just using single feature. And then the last one I'll show, this one's kind of cool. Um, in this case, control panels. If you're ever dealing with control panels, in this case we've got a panel with a lot of cutouts and a lot of text, a simple trick that you can use with control panels is what I did in this simplified configuration is I replaced it with a decal. And to make that decal, all I did was take a snapshot or a screenshot of what the actual panel looks like. So just a screenshot of the text and the holes. And then I filled in all of the holes with a single extrude, or I suppressed all of the holes, and just applied the decal as a picture. So this is just one single extrude. And if I hide my decal, or you know, if I go to edit my decal, this is honestly just the decal that is lined up to my part. So you can just line up that decal as a picture, and now your control panel has way less graphical triangles that's going to load a whole lot quicker without having all that text information and still conveys all the information that you need on a standard control panel. So use decals. That definitely cuts down on all of that information as well. So a couple different techniques you can use for simplified. So where is this all going? Now that we've made all of these simplified configurations, how do we use them? So there is one more trick that I passed over in SOLIDWORKS that I'll go ahead and show you now. Um, I'm going to have to go ahead and close all these parts. Now what happens if I've created all these simplified configurations, but I don't want to go to my overall assembly and have to click on every single simplified configuration, and I may miss some or may not. But if I go back to my file set, and if I sort by top level, by the way, this is how you get that error. This may take a while, is sorting by top level. I'm going to hit OK, just pass through it. But if I select the assembly I'd like to open, and I go down to my advanced, I can then create a new configuration showing all my reference components. And I'm going to call this my simplified configuration at the assembly level. But I'm also going to hit this checkbox to use a specified configuration for part references when available. So it's going to go through and find the simplified configuration for any reference part, as well as make a new simplified configuration at the assembly level as well. So this may take a little bit because it is creating that brand new configuration called simplified at the assembly level, and searching through each part file and seeing if there is an assembly configuration for the part file. But if it does see that simplified configuration at the part level, it's then going to open that part at the simplified level as well. So I'll just go ahead and hit OK. That was temporary font, um, of which case I'd have to go through and find another font. But again, that is slowing down open times too. So if I really wanted to take this further, I could go find a replacement font, resave my file. And again, SolidWorks won't have to go searching for those on open. So at this point, um, we are opening in large assembly mode. I can see at the bottom we're generating graphics. But once my file does open, I now have two different configurations. I've now got a simplified configuration at the assembly level. And now all of my parts, which have a simplified configuration, are now loaded in their simplified configuration. So a really easy way using that advanced open technique and configurations to open up a simplified assembly configuration with the simplified assembly configuration for your parts also. So a little bit of background about SOLIDWORKS, what SOLIDWORKS is doing. And I'm kind of reaching my time here, so I'm just going to cover with the numbers at the end as well. But just, give, just to give you an idea of everything SOLIDWORKS is doing when it's opening your file, as soon as you hit Open Assembly, it's going to load all the reference files. So this is a, there's a new in 2018 um, 
assembly dialog box that tells you what it's doing? Well, it loads all of your reference files first. And again, it's searching all of those locations if it can't find a file. Then it checks to see uh, when your assembly was last saved, updates any out-of-date components, goes through and solves any in-context relationships or mates. Once it solves all of those in-context mates, then it updates the graphics. And then if what you're opening is an assemb or a drawing file, it has to load the assembly first, but then it goes through the drawing file and has to see if your drawing file is up to date. And if it's not, update all of the configurations and views inside your drawing. So if you're ever wondering why SOLIDWORKS takes so long to open your assembly or your drawing, well, on one side, it is doing a lot. But on the other side, there's some things we can do to help SOLIDWORKS uh, to reduce all of the time and calculations that it takes to do these operations. But behind the scenes, SOLIDWORKS is doing a lot every time you hit open. So one last thing I'll leave you with, use performance evaluation. There is a tool inside SOLIDWORKS for your assemblies under evaluate right next to assembly visualization called performance evaluation. And it will break down a lot of statistics for you, such as what parts take the longest to open, which parts are previous documents, which parts you need to go through and save as the current revision or current version. It also gives you a list of the graphical triangle, so you can get that through assembly visualization. You can also get it through performance evaluation. So we can see there's a lot of triangles causing us this problem in a little PMI nut. Well, we could probably fix that. So all of your graphical triangle numbers are listed. Uh, image quality, it also calls out image quality. I hope I harped on that enough. Uh, any in-context mates, performances, and even gives you a breakdown of all of the mates as well as assemblies, sub-assemblies, and parts. So definitely use that performance evaluation inside SOLIDWORKS. Really good for identifying where your um, slowdowns are. And hopefully my presentation today, you picked up a trick or two um, that will help you with your large assemblies. So the last thing I'm going to cover is hardware. Um, if you're ever wondering where your bottlenecks are, these are the big three. The first one is your CPU clock speed. If you want to gain performance, overclock your processor. And I'm going to go through some numbers to show you that. We've done some tests. But basically, this is your, um, this is basically running everything in the background, all of the calculations. So the faster you can run calculations, the more calculations you're going to run per second. So that's all related to your core speed. And remember, SOLIDWORKS is largely single-threaded, so it's only ever going to use one core. So depending on your core speed, the faster your core speed, the more calculations you have per second. The second and the cheapest way you could probably get performance is through your RAM. Anytime you open your file, it's writing these, it's writing the information to temporary files. So if you have 8 gigs of RAM and you open a large assembly, you're probably going to hit that 8 gigs of memory really soon with it write, reading and writing data. So no matter how fast your clock speed is, if you don't have enough RAM, your bottleneck is going to be your RAM. And basically how much information you can write to your temporary storage it's going to have to unload some, reload some, unload some. So your bottleneck may be your RAM. So your clock speed, however fast it is, could be bottlenecked by your RAM if you don't have enough. Highly, highly recommend if you do large assemblies to have at least 16. But with how cheap RAM is, go with 32, go with 64. If you have a flash, faster clock speed, you're going to lose a lot of those gains if you don't have enough RAM. And finally, get a solid state drive. Because no matter how fast your clock speed is, say you have the fastest processor in the world, you've got a ton of RAM, at that point you're being bottlenecked by your read-write speed. It still has to go to your drive, it still has to read those files, it still has to write them to a temporary drive. So if you're still on an old mechanical drive, your bottleneck then is going to be your read-write speed. So get a solid state drive. It's going to be a whole lot quicker than a mechanical drive. So these are kind of your big three as far as hardware considerations. Get a faster clock speed get more RAM, and get a solid state drive. That's going to help you with your assembly performance. So here's the numbers. As I mentioned, uh, as I promised, uh, I compared a Dell M6800, which were computers we weren't using too long ago, um, to our new box computers, which are CAD optimized systems, so they overclocked the CPU. So they went from 2.8 gigahertz to 4 gigahertz. So these, these machines are lightning fast, and you can see in 2016, we went from 78 second open time to 56, but just by overclocking the processor. So we can see the times drop here in 17, drop to 45, and in 2018, drop down to 41 seconds. 
So pretty significant drop by overclocking your core speed. Definitely helps with your open times. Does version matter? In this case, we tried opening, um, in this case, like the older version file. So in 2000 Stalwarts 2017, if we open older version 16 files, it took 64 seconds. If we look at Solvers 2018, about the same. So they're both pretty, they're both slower opening older version files. But look what happens in Solvers 2017 when we upgrade the files of the current version. Drop the open times by like 20 seconds. And if we go to 2018, same thing. Drops the open time. And in 2018, we could only test in 18. It dropped the open time even more. So we don't see a huge jump moving from 17 to 18. But where we see our jump is saving the files to the latest version. So saving to the latest version is going to give you a benefit, an actual benefit on open time when you save to the latest version. And then finally, I hope I harped on this enough, set your image quality to low. Um, if we look at the numbers here, we basically are we're pretty consistent, high open times with high image quality. We are able to drop those by switching to low quality. So the fastest open time that we were able to get with these files is saving them all as 2018, using all of the simplified configurations, and setting everything to a low image quality, we went from not being able to open this assembly to being able to open it in 27 seconds, which is a pretty big jump in assembly performance. So with that, uh, that's my presentation. Looks like I'm right over time. Um, but I do want to stress to you guys that if you liked what you learned today and you want to go to another Catapult session, we have some upcoming webinars. Uh, you can register for those on our website, so I highly encourage you guys to come check it out. Uh, and that's pretty much what I got for you. All right, we do have a couple of questions that I'll answer. I see some folks jumping off the meeting, but we will answer a couple questions if the folks are still on um, briefly here. So the batch conversion, um, the, ta the, the question is, can the task scheduler run on a workgroup PDM vault? We can do that on a workgroup folder, correct? Do you know the answer to that? Um, I haven't really tested that. I'm not too involved on the PDM side. But I do know task scheduler runs outside the vault. Um, I actually, now that I say that, inside the vault there is a dispatch tool. So you'll definitely want to This is workgroup though. Somebody's asking about workgroup PDM. So I believe uh, you can do it in the workgroup vault, but um, you know, if not, just check it out and have it on your local file and run it on those. And yeah, I'll, I'll them in. Thing. Check it out, run it local, and check it back in. Yeah. All right, another question with regards to the advanced configurations. When you uh, are searching for simplified, they're asking if you can use wildcards in there. I don't think we can do that. It has to actually match the name of the configuration. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't think it's that smart. I think you have to, it's looking for a one-to-one -one match. So yeah. you have to get a um, sort of a best practice naming convention rolled <laughs> out at the company so you can, you can do that. So that's something you got to think about ahead of time a little bit. Correct, yeah. And then uh, someone asked, um, how can you get SOLIDWORKS to empty out files from memory after they are closed without closing the program? So there is no purge command or anything built into SOLIDWORKS. The thing to keep in mind is if you close a part file and an assembly is open that still references it, then that file is still open in RAM. So anywhere that file is used, you know, it's going to be uh, open. The only way to avoid that would be, uh, you know, to, to load that lightweight in the assembly. But when you close a file, uh, SOLIDWORKS will, you know, release that, you know, RAM. It may take a, a little bit, but uh, there is no way to manually purge anything. And let's see. Um, does using a solid part of an assembly reduce used resources as well? So the save as part uh, command, Jordan, you want to just give your thoughts on that? Um, I guess it's compared to what? Save as part as compared to... So I guess if somebody had a subassembly, let's say I download a subassembly that I'm using, it's a purchase part, but it's really a subassembly. If you're not going to edit or be changing the position in that assembly or anything like that, and you're just going to use it statically, yes, saving that as a part file versus yeah. ever using that again as a subassembly simplifies things and I think would provide a performance gain. Yeah, absolutely. I'd also recommend, too, if you don't care about changing it or geometries, save it out as a parasolid, re-import it, and then save it as a SOLIDWORKS part. That way you're even taking out all of the features. So just kind of try to dumb it down as much as possible. Yeah, that's going to save you performance. Absolutely. Yep. And then we had a question about um, how much real-world difference is there between SATA SSR and M.2 or PCI Express SSR. And um, probably getting down to the motherboard level and the speeds at that level is a little beyond our, our expertise, Jordan, if you have anything to add there. But I think that's probably... A no, down the, uh... Yeah, that's a little bit too far from my expertise, but <laughs> I, do, I do want to mention we do have a white paper um, that you may have seen. For um, We ran a bunch of tests trying to optimize uh, computer performance, and we really took a deep dive into the hardware. 
So there is a white paper out there. If you just search SolidWorks Caddy SolidWorks Performance, um, there's a nice big white paper that goes through a bunch of different tests for uh, how many cores you have, core speeds, video cards, everything hardware related. So I definitely recommend checking that out. Okay. Um, Kevin asked uh, for dumb solids. If import diagnostics looks good, does the file still slow the assembly? So no, a dumb solid actually is going to be the same as a part a part file in an assembly, right? For the most part, the assembly doesn't rebuild the feature tree at the part level. Um, exactly. So it's about triangles and size of the geometry when you get to the assembly. So dump solid, not going to hurt you at all. It just doesn't like if there's errors in there. It always uh, will cause things, whether you're doing interference detection or if the assembly is doing some other analysis and you've got an error, that's really what you want to get out of there to, to ensure that it doesn't slow down your assembly. Somebody said they're unable to pull up the SOLIDWORKS last version, the columns that you were showing in PDM. Um, do you know when that started? Do they have to have a newer version? Anything? Yeah, I think they introduced the last saved with around like 16, 15 or 16. It's been around for a little bit, but I do know some versions don't support it. Um, and I'm, like I said, I'm not 100% sure on the PDM side. I'd imagine that it is, but um, that would, I'd have to look into that. If you want to send Jordan an email on that, he can help you um, maybe square that away, Chris. So it's jordan.puentes at uh, cati.com, and we can try to help you out with that. Because he says he's on 2017. So, um, yeah, we'll try to help you out with that because it's a pretty slick feature. Sure. All right. Well, I think that's all the questions for the day. So for those of you that, uh, that hung around for all the questions, we thank you for attending. Hopefully you'll join us in the future. Jordan, great job, and appreciate all the additional information to help out our, uh, help out our users and CAD admins. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you all.